Hello. Thank you for joining us for today's message from Calvary in Lake Havasu City, Arizona. We are still in our series focusing on the book of Galatians called Fruitful Living. If you enjoy following along with the Life Notes, you can download them now at calvaryaz.com forward slash Life Notes. Now, here is Pastor Robert Smith. You can go ahead and have a seat. If you've got uh, a Bible or Bible app with you, you can uh, take that out. We're in uh, Galatians chapter 5. We have uh, been here for a little bit uh, looking at the fruit of the Spirit. And I hope by this point, and we've been in, uh, this is the eighth week, looking at uh, these character traits that we believe God wants every single one of his followers to live out. And we challenged you eight weeks ago to be memorizing, to be getting to know this list. And so uh, we're gonna do a little pop quiz. It is teacher day. So we're gonna do a little pop quiz for us. And if you are a guest and joining us, then, uh, then you get a little pass. But in Galatians 5, uh, verses 22 and 23, it says that the fruit of the Spirit, we'll say this together, are love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. It continues, against such things there is no law. And so we are uh, continuing to look at this. We're on the second to last of this list, which is gentleness. And, and I think it's so interesting as we look at the fruit of the Spirit, as we reflect on these things, and as we approach each of these as a standalone and go, what does this mean? How do we do these things? How do we embrace these character traits? We each analyze them differently. We come to these nine character traits with uh, preconceived notions and understandings. There's some that, that we dread and want to work around, like patience and self-control. We go, do we, do we have to include those in the list? Can it be seven fruit of the Spirit instead of nine? There's some that are amazing and encouraging, love, joy, peace. We go, yes, we want all of those three things. Can we double up on those? And then there's some that we're like, meh, they're just there. And I think that for many of us, that's gentleness. We go, eh, like it's, it's not something we necessarily want to avoid, but it's not something that excites us. Uh, but if we're, you know, th- those of you men in the room, maybe especially you hear gentleness and you go, uh, this one. Like it's not something that men get excited about being gentle. You, you know, it's, it's that one that's like, eh, that seems kind of like a sissy fruit of the spirit. Like why is it that that, that needs to be in there? Um, And yet it is. God in his perfect wisdom gives us that as a fruit of the spirit. And I think we challenge, we're we're challenged with gentleness because this isn't promoted in our world. Uh, We look around us and the culture instead promotes this this intense aggression. You got to go out there and get what you want and take life by the horns and go after it. You know, we're told to communicate with boldness and encourage and say, hey, this is, this is the truth. And especially online, you got to communicate the truth so everyone around you who's wrong is corrected. And you know, as an aside, is there any place in our world right now that needs more gentleness than the comment section of the internet? Like that is, that is completely devoid of all gentleness. Because we're told to, to, to live with this personal determination that sees aggression and brutality as a good thing. And so it's no wonder that we see gentleness and we go, well, eh, what's the point? Except when we step back and we think about all the ways that people interacting with us with gentleness throughout the span of our life has left this amazing positive impact on us. You know, I was thinking about some examples of just different characters and, and, and figures that interact with us in life and how they help us. Uh, just as by show of a poll, how many of you had a teacher throughout school that, that was gentle and saw you as a human and helped you and made a positive impact on your life? Yeah, look at that. You know, we, we have those, those figures in our life. Maybe it was a boss who just saw that you were in a, a season of personal struggle and, and stepped aside out of the, the mundane season of work to, to meet you with compassion and help. Maybe it was just a perfect stranger who at the perfect time helped you by showing an act of kindness and mercy and it just encouraged you. So you think that when people step aside from the the busyness of life and meet us with gentleness and compassion, it leaves this positive impact on us. And so it makes sense that God wants us to be people who live with gentleness because when we live that way, it allows to see the love and mercy of God in our life. When we are people who live with gentleness, people see the love and mercy of God through us. So how do we do that? Because this is something that we probably don't put a lot of thought into. We're not leaning into every day as we wake up, how do I be a gentle person today? So how do we do this? Well, we have to first start by understanding gentleness. 
I have to understand this for what it is and, and have a healthy definition of what, what gentleness is in our life so that we can live by it. And I think that it gets a bad rap because we too often confuse it with things that gentleness isn't. We think that living with gentleness is being weak or complacent, it's being a passive or a pushover, and that's not the case at all. And I think we struggle with that because we want to be people with strength. Maybe not physical strength, although maybe that is the case. You're like going to the gym to get those gains. But we want strength. We want strength in our willpower. We want strength in, in handling the difficulties of life. We want strength in our conviction, strength working through the, the difficult seasons that we face. So let me do a little poll here. How many of you want more strength in your life? Yeah, this is most of us. Most of us want more strength. And the good news is that God wants us to be people who are strong too. Joshua 1.9 says, Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous. Do not be frightened. Do not be dismayed. For the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So we desire to be strong. God desires for us to be strong. Where does gentleness fit into this? Well, I think that if we understand what God is communicating to us with this idea of gentleness, or some sections of Scripture refer to it as meekness, these are interchangeable ideas in Scripture, I think a healthy definition of this is strength under control. And this isn't original to me, I borrowed it from someone along the way, but, but gentleness is, is not being weak, it's not being complacent, it's not being a pushover, it is actually being strong, but using that strength in a controlled way. It is us choosing to, to not just let that run rampant, but instead have it under control. Because God desires for us to be strong and he meets us in that desire and be people who have conviction, who, people who speak the truth in love, people who are willing to be persecuted for our faith, people who are going to change the world. And these are things that God wants us to be and we can't do those things if we're weak and complacent and passive. In fact, the only way to actually show gentleness is to have strength to start with. And so we understand that, that gentleness isn't avoiding strength, it's not avoiding power, it's not avoiding those things, but instead using it in an intentional way, using it the way that God has instructed us to use it. So what's that look like? What's it look like to use our strength under control? I, I wanna walk through some, some moments and examples of this, and I want us to think about what it means to be people who are living in gentleness. And, and this is gonna strike some of you in different spots. Some of you are maybe that person, that imaginary person we referred to over the last few weeks, that jerk for Jesus. Some of you maybe resonate more with that. Some of you are like, oh, that might be me. Some of you like bulldozing people and being aggressive and sharing your thoughts uh, no matter what people think. And if that's you, I want you to just be honest with yourself tonight and go, man, I am not a gentle person. You don't have to you know, stand up and proclaim that and say, hey, I'm Robert, I'm not gentle. It's not that group, that's uh, Monday night at 6.30. You can, you can do that there at Celebrate Recovery. But I want you to just go, hey, this is a place of struggle for me. And so maybe just lean in and say, hey, I'm gonna reflect on what it means to live as a man or woman of God who is gentle. And take some notes and reflect on, on what God's calling you to. But on the flip side, some of you may just wanna tune out and go, man, I've, I've got this in the bag because maybe your life is more defined as someone who is passive, someone who doesn't frequently stand up or speak up, who lets other people set the agenda. But if that's the case, then, then that may not mean you're living with gentleness. It may mean that you're just living with passivity and, and living weak. And you may need to, instead of going, hey, I'm doing a good job, lean in and go, man, what is the strength that God is calling me to live in? What are the places of power and authority that he wants me to embrace in a healthy way and, and reflect on what it means to be a man or woman of God in that way? So as we, as we think about what it means to live in gentleness, like all things in, in scripture, like all things in the Christian life, I think the way that we start studying and, and learning how to do that is in the same place as everything else, and that is to stop and remember Jesus' example in this. Because Jesus is the perfect son of God and savior of the world. He came from, from heaven to earth. He lived a perfect life facing every struggle, every temptation, every hardship we have. And yet he did it with perfection. And so if we wanna understand, hey, how do we more live the life that God has called us to? Jesus is our role model. And so we have to start there as we do with everything. 
And so I want us to, to kind of look at, at three ways that Jesus models gentleness. And, and I'm going to bounce around uh, for a couple different scriptures, so I'm sorry that they're not in your notes, but you can jot them down and, and reference back. But the first place that we see this is in the way that Jesus spoke with truth. Most of Jesus' ministry was speaking or teaching and, and leading verbally, and he continued to speak truth. He didn't sugarcoat things. He didn't work around the, the hard subjects. Instead, he leaned into them, sometimes in a way that seems very direct and blunt, because he was so committed to speaking truth. And I want to read uh, one example that may not seem like Jesus leading with gentleness, but I think actually really helps us see this. In Matthew chapter 23, Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees, these religious leaders who are frequently hypocritical and, and go against the, the very heart of God and what he called them to. And in this, Jesus delivers what are known as the seven woes, these seven statements of judgment and condemnation and rebuke to them. I wanna read two of these. So, uh, so Matthew 23, verses 25 through 28 says, "'Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites!' You clean the outside of the cup and the plate, but inside are full of greed and self-indulgence. You blind Pharisee. First clean the inside of the cup and the plate so the outside may also be clean. Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs which outwardly appear beautiful, but within are full of dead people's bones and all uncleanness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but inside are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness." There's more. There's, there's a, almost a whole chapter of that. And if we think that, that gentleness is just passivity and conflict avoidance, we may see that passage and go, ooh, Jesus doesn't seem that gentle. If we imagine ourselves sitting in chairs where Jesus is delivering those statements of condemnation in a public forum, we may go, ooh, this Jesus guy is kind of unhinged. But if we remember that that gentleness is strength under control, and we go, are those two things demonstrated there? Well, there's certainly strength. There's no one who had a better grasp of truth on earth than Jesus himself. He's, he's delivering truth and connecting how their life was not aligning with God's word and how they were living in rebellion to it, so there is strength communicated there. He's not shying away from it. He's leaning into the truth, but it's also under control. See, he's not going on some unhinged tirade. He's not just yelling and screaming for no reason. He's doing this in an intentional way to hopefully bring conviction and repentance to them. And so even though this is an unpleasant moment for the, the hearers, this actually is a show of gentleness because Jesus was so concerned about them living with truth, but also them not leading people astray, that he had to deliver truth. He had to speak with truth. Because gentleness is not avoiding the hard things, but instead using strength under control. So Jesus speaks with truth and shows his gentleness there, but I think the one that we're more familiar with is the ways that he offered grace. And, and there, this is a, a whole sermon series in and of itself, the ways that, that Jesus showed gentleness through grace and mercy to those around him. And, and we could spend the rest of our sermon on just this, but I wanna look at one passage that I think is a very powerful example of this. In John chapter eight, we see a, a very odd moment where Jesus is publicly asked to respond to someone's sin. And we get an interesting view of how Jesus navigates this. John chapter eight says that they went out to their own house, but Jesus went to the Mount of Olives. Early in the morning, he came again to the temple and all the people came to him and he sat down and taught them. Now the scribes and the Pharisees brought a woman who had been caught in the act of adultery. And placing her in the midst, they said to him, teacher, this woman has been caught in the act of adultery. Now the law, Moses commanded us to stone such women, to execute them. So what do you say? And they said this to test him, that they may have some charge to bring against him. But Jesus bent down and wrote with his finger on the ground. And they continued to ask him, and he stood up and said to them, let him who is without, the, without sin among you be the first to throw a stone at her. And once more, he bent down and wrote on the ground. But when they heard it, they went away one by one, beginning with the older ones, and Jesus left alone with the woman standing before him. Jesus stood up and said to her, woman, where are they? Has no one condemned you? She said, no one, Lord. And Jesus said, then neither do I condemn you. Go, and from now on, sin no more. And this is a powerful moment because the 
the culture that they were living in allowed for the woman and the man who's conveniently absent from this story to be executed for this sin, for this offense. And so they bring this woman and they, they bring her before Jesus to, to, to trap Jesus into, hey, there's a no-win situation here. He either ignores the law of Moses or he acts with, with judgment and hatred and orders this woman's condemnation, but Jesus draws a third option. And he understands that this woman is deserving of grace and mercy. And all throughout scripture, we see moments like this where people are brought and judgment and retribution could be ordered, but Jesus meets a repentant person with mercy and grace and forgiveness. And the amazing news is that he does that for each one of us. He sees us in our place of sin and rebellion and defiance, and, and he doesn't order the, the worst in terms of consequences and retribution, but sees our heart and offers us mercy and forgiveness and grace. He shows us gentleness by not giving us what we deserve, but instead offering us this powerful opportunity of forgiveness. And I think that as a category is the last place that we see his gentleness, and that is that, that he offers help and salvation to us. Jesus says this in Matthew chapter 11. He says, come to me, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon me and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. See, Jesus says that we can come to him and we can call him our Lord and Savior and find forgiveness and find a release of the burden of sin and condemnation in our life. That we can have our life changed simply by coming to him and asking for forgiveness. And there's nothing required of us except believing in that and giving Jesus our allegiance and obedience for the rest of our life. But it doesn't end there. It's not just this one moment, but he continues to show his gentleness through the ways that he offers help. He says, hey, come to me when you're, you're weary and heavy laden. I'll give you help. Come to me when you're overwhelmed and scared. Come to me when you're lost and confused. Come to me when you don't have direction. Jesus says, I will continue to meet you there with help and gentleness. So Jesus perfectly models this for us. We are are then called to say, how do we live this out? This is the way that Jesus has lived in, in each of his ways. How do we do that? And I think there's two things that we have to do if we want to then go and live this out personally. And the first is that we have to understand our strength. If gentleness is strength under control, we have to start by understanding the strength that God has given us. And this isn't just the physical strength, although that's certainly connected to it, but the strength of the different areas of our life. How do we have these, these areas? What are the areas that we need to control and be intentional with? And the first area of strength that we have to pay attention to is our words, because our words have power. Our words are probably the most direct way that we either live with gentleness or we don't. Jesus' half-brother James, he, he has an entire book that, that he penned, and in the third chapter, he talks about the ways that our tongue, our speech is so powerful. He compares it to all these other things that, that are very influential in our world. He says, the rudder of a ship is incredibly small, yet it directs the entire course of that ship. He says, the bit that you put in the mouth of the horse is small, and yet it determines where that horse goes. He says the spark is small and yet it can set an entire forest ablaze. And with that in mind, he points out the difficulty of controlling our speech. And then he says this. He says, with it, with our tongue, we bless our Lord and Father and with it we curse people who are made in the likeness of God. From the same mouth come blessing and cursing. My brothers, these things ought not be so. Isn't that a, a convicting challenge of how we often neglect to see the power of our words? It's so easy to both bless and curse people with the words that we use. We have incredible strength there. We're using it under control. I don't know about you, but I've had moments where, where I've had people come up to me and say, hey, I, I need to tell you something. And there's a story that follows of, of something I said to them that was encouraging. And usually this has been in a ministry context. Something I said was, was helpful and encouraging to me. It was really uplifting. And it's always a nice surprise. But on the flip side of that, 
seems that more often there's moments where people have come up and shared that something I said hurt them. Something that I don't even remember saying, something that seemed to be a passing moment that stuck with them and there was pain and, and hurt connected to that. And it's there, and I wish I could say that the first moment was more frequent than the second, but that's not the case. Because I, I, I've, I've had this desire to always lighten the mood and make things fun and funny, and so sometimes I've made jokes at the expense of people's feelings. And so I've had to learn that my, my words have power, even the ones that seem quick and fleeting. But the same is true for all of us. Our words have incredible power to bless or to curse people. So how are you using them? Are you using your words to uplift and encourage people, or are you using them to criticize and put them down? How would your, your family, the people that you spend the time behind closed doors with, describe your words? Would they say they're gentle? Would they say that you use it to bless and help and encourage, or would they have a different story? What about the people you work with or your friends? Are you constantly negative and criticizing and condemning the people around you? Are you using your words to uplift and encourage and point them towards Jesus? See, if we want to be people who live with gentleness, it has to start with our words because our words have incredible power, incredible power that, that lasts far longer than just the moment that we speak them. And so we have to make the intentional choice to use our strength under control to control our speech, to control the words that we use, the tone that we say it with, the, the, the motivation that we speak with so that our speech honors God and blesses people. So we have strength in our words. Secondly, we have strength in our influence. See, whether you realize it or not, you have influence over people. Now, the, the size of that influence, the strength of the influence varies, but you have influence of the people around you. You have influence to determine how things go, the tone of the room, the, the decision that's made, the advice that's given. You have influence. And, and I want you to just think about some of the circles of influence you have, maybe in your family, at work, in your friend circles. Who do people, uh, who, who comes to you for advice? Who asks you for how to navigate decisions? Who's constantly seeking to be around you and to learn from you? Because these are the people you have influence with. But just like our words, we can use that influence for good or for evil. We can use the influence that we have to essentially abuse that influence and, and use people to get what we want, to have power and control over them, to, to be the one in charge. Or we can use that influence to encourage, to build people up, to help them, to uplift them and encourage them. So how are you using your influence? Is is the household lighter and have a happier tone when you're at home or when you're away? Because that's connected to your influence. Same at work. Are people excited when you're there at work because they know it's gonna be a good day or do they groan when you come in because they're hoping you're gonna call out sick? <laughs> that's influence. Are you using it to make the world around you better or just to make your world better? So we have power, we have strength in our words and our influence, and we have strength in our resources that God has asked us to, to use under control to honor him. And, and our resources look different for each of us. Some, for some of you, that's possessions, that's things that you own that you can use to bless people and to help them and to encourage them. For some, it's the ability to make and manage good sums of money that, that God says that you can control that to bless the kingdom, to fund ministries and build buildings and bless people in his name. For some, it's our abilities. You can fix things or build things. You can teach. You can be a good listener and friend. You can be a good encourager. You can do lots of things. You have strength. How are you using that? Because I think we all have a default that we think, oh, all of those resources, all of those blessings are just for me. But First Peter chapter four gives us a different direction. It says this, it says, it's each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Living gently means seeing the resources and the things that we have as things not just to make our life better, but to bless and help the people around us. So are you doing that? Do you see the resources, the things, the talents, abilities that you have as a tool that you can use to serve and help others or 
just to make your life better. Because we have strength in these areas that God is asking us to use under control, under his direction. But really, all this drives to the point that we have to really get to, and that is that we have to make the decision to allow God to direct our strength. See, all of this, it comes to this decision point. Are we going to allow God to direct the strength in our life? The strength of our words, the strength of our influence, the strength of our our resources and abilities. What are we going to do with those things? Because we have options. That's the great thing. It's just like McDonald's. We have options. We can choose how we manage the things that God has given us, these places of strength and power. We get to choose. And so we can choose to abuse our strengths. We can take these things and go, well, I'm gonna do whatever I want with them. I'm gonna make my life better. I'm gonna control people. I'm gonna take advantage of them. I'm gonna make my life better at the expense of everyone else. It's not a good option. It's not an honorable option. It's not one that honors God, but it's an option. So we can abuse our strength. Secondly, we can, we can, uh, I forgot my word here. We can abandon our strength. We can, we can put our head in the sand and forget that we have that strength, that we have those, the power and, and authority in those areas. We can just abandon it completely. And it's a little better than abusing it, but it's still not honoring to God because it's ignoring the places that we can make the world around us better. It's ignoring the ways that we can serve. It's ignoring the ways that we can bless people if we just go, yeah, I don't have anything to offer. Or we can apply our strength biblically. We can understand that God has given us directions. God has given us wisdom in his word of how to navigate all these situations in life. And we can say, I'm going to apply my strength in a way that honors God. I'm gonna put it under control and surrender to him. And it's gonna challenge us. There's there's not gonna always be easy to apply this idea of gentleness and strength under control. There's gonna be places where we wanna step out of control and we have to realize, no, that's not what God is calling me to. I don't have to be right in this moment. I don't have to let my voice be heard. I don't have to have control here. I don't have to make it about me over there. It's not always going to be easy. But if you have decided to call Jesus your Lord and Savior and and, and surrender your life to him, then you've actually already made that decision. You've already decided to surrender and lay down your will and instead follow his direction and guidance for your life. So the question is, are you gonna do that on this area? Are you gonna live a life of gentleness or are you going to make your life about yourself? So let me ask you today, are you living in gentleness? Are your words gentle? Do the people around you see your presence, your speech, how you interact with them as one defining with gentleness or do they see your speech and your conduct in a different way? Is your influence something that is being used to bless and help others to change the tone of the environments you're in for the better, or is it just about you? You're using your resources to bless God's kingdom and help others, sometimes even without credit, or is it just about making your life better? See, we all want to be strong people, and the good news is that God wants us to be strong as well, but he wants us to use that strength under control and live with gentleness. Because when we live with gentleness, it allows people to see the love and mercy of God through us. So we get to decide, are we going to live with gentleness? I pray that you will, and that your life begins to be defined by God's plan for your life in this area, and that people would see the love and mercy of God in your life. Let's pray. God, we thank you that you meet us with gentleness that you don't meet us with anger and condemnation and hatred, but instead you sent your son Jesus to offer a path for us to be saved, to offer a way for us to be forgiven, for us to be set free from our sin and condemnation. And God, you have called us to a life that is not always easy, a life following you and your example, a life where we say no to the, the desires of of our our broken, sin-filled heart, and instead, we're called to live following your instructions. And God, it is not easy to live with gentleness in our world. It is not easy to to work against this, this pushy, aggressive culture and to live with gentleness, but God, I pray that you would help us to do that. 
Help us to not be annoyed with the people around us, but instead to meet them with grace and kindness. Help us to not live selfish, prideful, arrogant lives, but instead take on the form of a servant like your son Jesus and live with gentleness in that. And God, we thank you that every single day we get to come to your son and bring our burdens and, and cast them down at his feet and find rest for our souls is that continual reminder of how you meet us with gentleness. Help us to do the same to the world around us. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Jesus showed gentleness by caring for people who were sick and suffering. In James 1.27, it says, religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained from the world. So how are you doing? Are you displaying gentleness to those you come in contact with? If you have questions or would like prayer, please consider filling out our online connect card by visiting calvaryaz.com forward slash connect. One of our pastors will reach out to you and pray with you. Well, that's all for today. Join us next weekend where we'll be focusing on self-control. Have a great week. Bye-bye.